Nearly a quarter of a century ago, the Black Vault was born. I was 15 years old when I started what you're seeing now, and it was at that same age back in 1996 that the CIA quickly found out the name John Greenwald. I tried to gain access to documents on UFOs that the CIA had already released to the public at the time, but the CIA pushed back on my efforts by charging me money to get them, and that was money I just didn't have as a teenager. So I switched gears. I targeted the information the CIA had never released before. It was more recent and quite possibly even more interesting, but I had no idea what else they would have in store for me when I tried to do just that. In an in-depth and convoluted tale that stretched over the course of years, the Black Vault would finally pry loose thousands of UFO-related documents that at the time had never seen the light of day before. And recently, a data CD-ROM also obtained from the CIA by the Black Vault, which compiled most of these UFO records, was put online in an effort to make the most simplistic and straightforward way to download each and every page, all for your public consumption. It took only a few days for the Black Vault servers to be hit more than 101 million times by nearly 1.7 million people a record hit of traffic ever logged in my 25 years of operation. What is in these records? Why is the public so fascinated by them? And what did the media get wrong about it all? Stay tuned, you're about to journey inside the Black Vault. That's right, everybody. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and making this your podcast or your live stream of choice. I'm your host, John Greenwald Jr., and I'm uh, pretty excited about the response from the media and the general public to the CIA UFO records, which is exactly what this video is all about. Now, obviously, you've seen a lot of the headlines. If you haven't, well, I'd be surprised. It's everywhere, to my surprise. I did not expect this. I did an interview with, with Vice News, which started it all. We'll get into some of that. Uh, but obviously, it has resulted in a ton of you subscribing to this YouTube channel, maybe to the podcast, seeing the website. It has been an incredible ride to see the response to this. Now, I've received a ton of questions, not only from the media, but obviously all of you guys as well, about what this is, what it isn't, what's going on. Is this related to the UAP report? What, what is this all about? So I decided to do this video to essentially address just that. Now, I got to say up front, this is 25, almost 25 years in the making. My history with the CIA goes back literally to 1996. That was the first year that I started the Black Vault, as I already went through in the introduction. And in that time frame, a ton of stuff has happened when it comes to fighting for the documents, communicating with the CIA, trying to get this material out. It is a long history. Sadly, the media didn't represent it 100% entirely accurately. Big shocker. Uh, I've, I've talked a lot about the media on this channel. And although I don't want to come off as, you know, a negative Nancy all the time about that, it is important to get the facts right. So I want to go over a little bit about the background to the documents, the real background, the provable background, and also some of the misconceptions that happened in the media. Let me first start with the background of, of the documents themselves. 
This, this literally goes back to the late 1970s, the origin of getting the CIA UFO material out. Yes, it has taken that long for some of this stuff to come out. Now, there were FOIA cases, Freedom of Information Act cases, back in the late 70s and early 1980s, uh, which resulted in about a 1,000 pages to be released. This is known as the Ground Saucer Watch, or um, Citizens Against UFO Secrecy was a later name. The attorney was Peter Gersten. Uh, he had a role in both of the court cases. They both had triumphs. They both uh, essentially yielded uh, the CIA UFO material to, to, to come out. You'll see here on your screen if you're watching the video, these are some of the original Freedom of Information Act requesters. Larry Bryant, who recently passed away, uh, who I've known, uh, who I knew for a very long time, excellent researcher. I didn't realize he was filing requests back in 1973. I mean, this guy was a machine. He did a ton of stuff. Brad Sparks, a name you you likely recognize. Uh, this is Todd Zeckel, another name. I believe he's passed away. I, I could be wrong on that. William Spalding, another name. Anyway, this is how far that, that this part of the story goes back is to the mid to late 1970s. All of the groups were, all of the requests were, were kind of grouped together. Then the court cases resulted in about a thousand pages of material that was released. I think it was 992 pages to be exact. But those were the original CIA UFO documents. That was the early 1980s when they finally came out. The, the judge uh, of the case sided with these organizations and the CIA came out with the material. Now, fast forward to 1996. I was 15 years old, wanted to find out what was going on, who had what, and the CIA was one of my targets. I knew that they must have UFO intelligence. They must. Not only because I read about it in the books, but I felt that there may be more than that. Now, I was not at the time aware of those court cases, but I did know that there were documents released and I went after those. Now, when they started trying to charge me for that, I was 15, like I said, so I didn't have that money. I, I couldn't just write a check. I forget what the exact amount was, um, but they had tried to just essentially squash the effort with the charge because they knew that I, 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 I probably couldn't do it. I don't think that that was too malicious, though, to be honest with you. The, the documents had been released before. So that's why I changed gears. That's why I decided to go after the post-1980 time frame from then to present day at the time, which was 96. The CIA, for that time frame, would try and sell you those documents. They would not do new searches. So when you file a Freedom of Information Act request, you can stipulate the time frame. When it came to the CIA UFO material, let's say it was 1996 when I started, they said, okay, John, we'll give these to you for X amount of dollars. You go ahead and write the check and we'll give them to you. But the problem was, was that was approximately 16 years after those records were released. So what, if anything, was collected in, the, in those 16 years? So that's what I went after. So I, I shifted gears, said, okay, guys, I don't want to buy that. They've been out before. So let's just get away from that. I went after the new stuff, the newer material. And that led into this entire saga of going back and forth and back and forth. I can't tell you how many times there were quite a few. I still have some of the original letters uh, stored off site. I didn't have them here uh, and they weren't really easy to get to. So I'm sorry I didn't show them. Uh, I, I, I believe that I've posted them before years ago. But I never knew that it would be such a problem to get them to just process the request the way I asked for it. And it literally took years of going back and forth because every time that I would say, hey, I want the material post-1980. I don't care about the previously released stuff, to, uh, stuff anymore. I want that stuff. And finally, after a couple of years, they said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll process it the way you requested. Why they couldn't do that on the first round, I have no idea. I've never found out. It was so incredibly frustrating. What did they do? 
they sent me a bill. And they found an approximate 2,000 more pages of material. And so I posted online, the Black Vault was growing at this time. We're getting into the late 1990s. And a lot of people wanted to help. And so what I did was essentially do crowdfunding back then, but it wasn't uh, the same as it is now. You know, you start a GoFundMe campaign. I've done a couple of them and have raised the material. Back then was a little bit different. I had a P.O. box. You know, people would send in $5 checks, $10 checks. So that was how I raised the money. And 100% of what I got went right back into the documents, raised the money, uh, because at that time, uh, you know, I was pretty much still in, in high school, couldn't really afford a couple hundred dollars at that time, raised the money and waited and waited months for these documents to come. And I remember when they finally did, and I was so excited because I, I raised enough money to buy both batches. So the 2000 approximate pages that they found the new, the new stuff and the thousand pages that was previously released. The first box I opened, it came in two boxes. First box I opened was that material, the stuff that was previously released. So I didn't go through page by page. I was like, okay, that's what this is. This next box, never seen the light of day before. Never ever had been out of the United States government or the CIA, uh, according to them. And I ripped open that box. I started going through the documents and realized almost every one of them were newspaper articles. And it was the text that they had collected from around the world. My initial reaction was I was incredibly frustrated. I wanted those blacked out reports. Well, I didn't want them blacked out. But I mean, those are the ones you kind of go for. I'll show one in a little bit to kind of give that idea. And so after that frustration kind of settled a little bit, I thought, okay, let's just really start to, to, to look at this stuff. Let, let's kind of figure out what exactly did they give me. And it kind of went from there. And, and over the years, the CIA found additional material, not only for myself, but other requesters. And soon enough, you know, they had amassed more than uh, 2,800, 2,900 pages or so. And that's how much they had on, on UFOs. So over the years, they then got so tired of people asking for the UFO stuff and selling it page by page. They said, okay, we, we'll make a CD-ROM. But they never advertised they had the CD-ROM. There are researchers that have it. Uh, I, I know that uh, Jack Brewer, if you look at uh, like UFO Twitter type posts, uh, he's he's uh, uh, somebody who had recently posted it as well. And I had already had all the documents, or at least I thought. And I said, okay, well, you know, what's 10, 10, 10 bucks or so, you know, to buy the CD-ROM and make sure that I had a hundred percent of the material that had spanned over literally decades of the CIA spitting these things out into the public. The problem with that, though, is let's say one researcher gets it, unless they truly run an archive and really get attention to it, it doesn't matter if a document's released before. If nobody's seen it, it really kind of doesn't matter. And if the person that, that received it doesn't really do anything with it, again, it's, it's just kind of, yeah, it's not really in the public realm. You know, it doesn't matter if it was released before. So I purchased the CD. And there were 713 documents on it. So I converted them to searchable PDFs. TIFF files are archaic. I'm not going to get geeky here, but this is what the CIA does. They make it as difficult as possible uh, to use this as a viable research tool. So what I did was I converted all of the thousands of pages from the multi-page TIFF to PDFs, searchable, plopped it online. I then created a zip file of all of that, made it incredibly easier, uh, easy for researchers to be able to download it, posted it online. The Black Vault has a, a you know, not a, a gigantor reach or anything, uh, but it reaches quite a few different journalists, especially on Twitter. And uh, Vice News had kind of picked up that I had done this. So a journalist, Samir Ferdowsi, uh, and I'm sorry if I have that pronounced incorrectly, uh, but Samir had contacted me and said, hey, I've got some questions about your CIA UFO material. Can I ask you some questions? I said, sure. Yeah, not a problem. Very cool. Vice News had profiled the Black Vault a couple times in the past, so um, I had no objection to that and uh, answered the questions. On January 11th, he published the article. And uh, sadly, there were, you know, a couple things that, that weren't entirely accurate. I don't 
you know, again, I, I don't like to harp on anyone, but I do want to make sure that the correct information is out there. So I'll deal with that in a second. But once that went out there, other news agencies saw it, thought it was a cool story, started picking it up. It soon went literally viral within about a day. What you're looking at on the screen here, are just some of the, the numerous articles literally around the world in, in the coming days that profiled this. Some were very accurate, some, uh, you know, not so much, uh, but there was a lot of attention to this and it just blew up, which is why a lot of you are probably here. I give the backstory to these types of things just so you can understand how everything unfolded because sometimes it's not so obvious. Here's one particular uh, newspaper. I guess this was just today. This is uh, a big uh, newspaper overseas. Front page coverage. So, and um, I'm not real familiar with this, to be honest with you. I think it's Italian. Um, but I, I, from what I understand, this is one of the biggest papers over there. But anyway, it was getting and has gotten, and as I record this, still is getting a ton of international attention. This is the biggest spike, actually, that I've ever been able to log on the Black Vault. So it's a, a massive traffic increase to this material. I do want to talk a little bit about what's what was misreported before I get into some of the documents. I know that that's why you guys are here, but I do like to give backstories. That way you understand how things kind of unfold. Here's what was misreported on what I want to kind of talk about. It didn't take 10,000 FOIA requests to get these CIA UFO documents. That was an error. I'm not sure where that came from. Uh, I did give a quote about me filing 10,000 FOIA requests total to amass 2.2 million pages that you see on the blackvault.com. That's on every topic that's out there, you know, that I deal with. That's not just UFOs, that's not just the CIA. So that was that was kind of a blaring error uh, that got repeated through quite a few different media outlets. This is not related to the UAP or UFO report that's required within 180 days of the Intelligence Authorization Act that um, recently passed. This is probably the number one uh, question that I am asked about this. And so up front, the, the answer is no. The, and this is a prime example why I give that backstory, that it goes back 25 years, has nothing to do, um, or my story, my part of the story, 25 years, but obviously the original documents that came out in, in 1980 or so. So it has nothing to do with that. That report, if you're not aware, is due roughly around June. I, I'm probably going to do another video about that specifically, but I at least wanted to dispel the myth and the rumor because some newspaper articles did publish that. There's absolutely zero connection to that. This release was not a surprise data dump by the CIA. That also was often touted. Uh, this, this was not a one-time data dump. Uh, this obviously was a data dump by the Black Vault uh, based on the CD, but CD-ROM had been, been around for quite some time, the documents much longer than that. The one that got me was apparently, uh, these were called the CIA's Black Vault documents. So they kind of combined the CIA with myself. I think they, some agencies, I don't know if it was a translation error or you know what, but uh, even Drudge Report, when he picked this up and, and profiled it, his original headline was uh, something to the effect of uh, CIA released Black Vault documents. And it's like, well, wait a minute, that's not right. As a result of that, I started getting even more accusations about being a CIA front and I'm an agent and I'm some kind of uh, misinformation tool uh, an arm of the CIA because they and myself work hand in hand. All of that is a rumor. <laughs> I do not uh, work for the CIA, nor is the Black Vault connected in any way. The last thing I'll clear up, it was exactly 2,780 pages in 713 documents, not millions of pages. Uh, that also was, was reported uh, very incorrectly by some of the uh, big media outlets out there. Now, the last thing that I want to kind of dispel away from the media is misinformation, disinformation, misreporting, incorrect facts, whatever you want to call them from inside the UFO community, namely uh, some, a couple bloggers and, and uh, 
named, I don't want to, you know, call anybody out, but the reaction by some is very surprising because they have posted and have tried to lead people to believe, oh, none of this is, is uh, new. It's been online for years. Part of that is true, but not all of it. The part that they want you to believe for whatever reason is don't pay attention to it because it's been online. The CIA has had these documents. That made me push a little bit for myself to kind of confirm, hey, I, I'm pretty confident that these collections are not complete. Uh, I felt that I had the majority of them on the Black Vault, but the CIA over the years started adding them to their website. And they give what I call the illusion of transparency, that they have everything on there. They give you everything and you don't need to go after anything else because we give it away freely. And that has permeated inside the UFO community as well, where, again, some bloggers, researchers, so on, they truly believe that none of this material is is important simply because it's been online for years by the CIA or myself or, or whatever. And by digging, you realize how incomplete the, the archive was. So I'm actually thankful for that accusation that none of this was new, simply because it made me look at how bad the CIA's record keeping really is. And when you go onto their website, they have an electronic re reading room. It's a great resource. It's, it's kind of hard to use, uh, but it is a great resource where you can search millions of pages. I, I know that they have quite a bit of data on there and they also have special collections. So if you're interested in cold war, if you're interested in any of that material, uh, go on there. There's, there's a ton of material that, that you can download. Uh, but on there is the UFO special collection but also another collection called UFOs Fact or Fiction. So they have two different collections of UFOs, both essentially touted as the collection on UFOs. Why they did that, I have no idea. But when you look at the collection and, uh, collection and how many there are, 415 in this one, 243 in that one, yes, there is overlap, but let's just give them the benefit of the doubt and say that, well, they just split it into two collections, but it's complete. Even if they there was no overlap whatsoever, they still fall short of the 713 documents that I had put on from the CD-ROM. My whole point in pointing that out is time and time again, U.S. government agencies want to give the illusion that they are being fully transparent and they are releasing everything they have on a particular topic, in this, in this case, UFOs. But that is not true. And time and time again... I've proven that is a lie. Whether it's intentional or not, I have no idea, but it's not true. And another prime example that I just learned in the last couple of years, and I've kicked myself for, for not really realizing it earlier, is the FBI itself has a reading room and they release FBI files on celebrities, historical figures, whomever it might be. They also give the illusion of transparency. So let's say you download everything on Martin Luther King Jr. Or, you know, they even have a file on John Wilkes Booth. Uh, but if you download these files, they make it seem like it's everything. And I decided a couple years back to start challenging that, going through the FOIA and going after additional records. In nearly every case, their files are not complete. And so you realize, even though they want to give that illusion, hey, we're being transparent, we've given you everything on UFOs or Martin Luther King Jr. or the JFK assassination or whatever, you push back a little bit and you easily prove that they are not being honest with you. Uh, some people might uh, use the search engine, search for UFO, you'll come up with like 14, 1500 hits. So you might immediately think, well, hey, hey, there's a lot more there. Uh, don't get too excited. Looks can be deceiving. Uh, these are all hits on UFOs. Uh, you can see they are not UFO. When you, when you, it's called OCR. When you do an optical character recognition on documents that are 50, 60 years old, you see how bad this typewriter, it, you know, comes through on a 50th generation photocopy. So you can clearly see that this is not saying UFO for those listening to the podcast and not seeing what I'm talking about. Uh, one particular document uh, is in a foreign language. And it says uh, UYB, I think it is. Uh, but the translator, the online translator, sees that as UFO. 
Uh, here's another one that's in German, uh, P-R-I, next word, P-O-L-E, and then it's kind of unreadable. Uh, it combines two of those words into a UFO, but obviously that's not what it says. Here's a one in English, date of info. Uh, info is kind of you know messed up and garbled a little bit when you look at it visually. And the optical character recognition process sees that as UFO. So the search engine is is very, very misleading on how many documents they have on, on UFOs. Here's a screenshot of the zip file that the Black Vault created. Uh, I put this out there just so people had a one-click, one-stop shop to get all 713. Here you go. There's 713 files. It should look like that. I only vouch for the zip file that is on my server. If you download it anywhere else, just be careful. Uh, since this is so popular, there is, have literally been hundreds and hundreds of thousands of downloads of this of this file. So since it is highly sought after, just be careful where you download it. I only vouch for my mirror. So let's get into why you're here. What is exactly in the documents? What is important? What is not? Uh, forgive me. What exactly is there? What I want to do before I get into that is just give you a very quick background to understand the mindset of the United States government around this time frame, not only about the documents, but how those documents and how this era played a role in what they wanted you to believe. In 1947, the United States Air Force created Project Blue Book. They investigated over 12,000 sightings. This was labeled as the official United States government slash United States military investigation into UFOs. And this was the project that is often cited as saying we investigated it, found nothing to this, we don't care about it, please stop bothering us, do not look into the topic anymore because we don't care. That set the precedent for how every U.S. government agency has responded to UFO inquiries up until the last couple of years, because obviously that's, you know, we've, we've changed that a little bit uh, when it comes to their, their answering of questions. But up until the last couple of years, they've always denied interest that in 1969, when Project Blue Book closed, that was it. Pardon the pun, but that literally closed the book on government and military connections to UFOs altogether. That is not true, and there's ample evidence for that, but at least I wanted to give those who aren't aware of that background the background. That is what they wanted you to believe. Post-1969, they had zero interest in UFOs, they were not a threat to national security, and they weren't alien. That was what they wanted you to believe. But behind the scenes, when you look at the actual evidence, when you look at the actual documents, another story appears entirely. One of the CIA documents, this is one of my favorites. I have a short list of favorites. I'll go over a couple of them. But this is one of the CIA documents. Now, for those that are watching, instead of just listening to the podcast, you'll see on the upper left-hand corner, uh, which I have messed up <laughs> because now it is covered. Uh, let me see if I can uh, quickly, I'm going to quickly move myself on the fly here so I can reveal what I was just talking about. That number, I won't say it uh, verbally just because it gets a little bit tedious on these numbers. They're a little bit long, uh, long. but for those uh, watching, you can just go to my archive and download that file if you want to see these particular records. So I cited them there for you. So this is the first one. This was from 1976. Again, seven years after the United States government said, hey, we investigated these things. We don't care. You can see here UFO research was in the subject line. This was 22 April 1976. A lot of blacked out information up here. Uh, the the, the uh, document itself had talked about, and I'm going to read a couple lines here. Item number two, we contacted the A slash DDSNT, that's the Assistant Deputy Director for Science and Technology within the CIA. His name was blacked out and redacted. I tried to figure out exactly who this might be uh, before this presentation. By the time I recorded, I couldn't, uh, but there may be somebody out there that knows their history. They may know who that is. If you do, feel free to contact me. I'll definitely give you credit for that. 
Uh, but but with a little bit of digging, that that name should be able to we should be able to figure that out. Uh, but anyway, this this particular doctor was contacted by unknown people. They also were redacted. They had hand delivered a piece of evidence in relation to this UFO research to his office. They talk about this here. Doctor, and it's redacted, exhibited interest in blank. So whatever the evidence was is redacted, which was hand carried to his office. After a short examination of its context uh, contents, Dr. Redacted advised us that he would personally look into the matter and get back to us. As we discussed in reference A, Dr. Redacted has since contacted us and relayed the following information. Number three, it would appear to be best if you advised whomever that is, it's redacted, that he should, and then it's all redacted. So whatever the advice was about this piece of a UFO, this piece of evidence, this tangible, physical something rather that was hand delivered to his office, he was giving advice on what these, what I believe were agents uh, with the CIA, what they should do. Now, why is this important? Well, this is getting into one of the most valuable aspects to the UFO phenomena, physical evidence. A lot of times your physical evidence or bur blurry photographs and in this day and age, you know, maybe some bad film reels or whatever, that's pretty hard to figure it out. But what is redacted here? What is this physical object that they hand carried into this assistant deputy director's office within the CIA? Why would they do that seven years after the entire government closed the book on any of their UFO interest? This obviously was something important because it piqued his interest. And the advice that he gave, well, we have absolutely no idea uh, what it was because it's redacted. Page number two, let me read a couple more lines. At the present time, there are offices and personnel within the agency who are monitoring the UFO phenomena. But again, this is not currently on an official basis. Why were they monitoring, monitoring the phenomena? They already did their investigation through the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s. Yes, it was an Air Force investigation, but they were the lead in essentially the U.S. government and military as a whole, CIA included. There are instances where the CIA communicated cases to Project Blue Book for investigation. So again, even though that was United States Air Force, CIA was still involved. That should have been case closed at that point, and it was not. There were still people, as this document proves within the CIA, still interested in monitoring the topic. Another line, we wish to stress again that there does not now appear to be any special program on UFOs within the intelligence community, and this should be relayed to redacted. So who were they keeping informed? The director of the CIA, the Air Force, some other agency who was involved in research? We just don't know. But that name was redacted. So very interesting document, in my opinion, one of the better ones because of that physical evidence aspect and the proof that the CIA had not lost interest at all. Here's another one uh, from April 1976. This is from an unknown source. You see it's blacked out here. Uh, he is employed, you know, whether it's C I, I, I would believe that it's um, outside of the CIA, uh, this particular line here from the DCD. That's called the Domestic Collection Division. It's a very interesting history with the CIA, but in short, the CIA, although they primarily focus on foreign matters at, at this time, that wasn't always the case. They, they, they stay away from domestic issues now, but back then they had this DCD that would actually look at matters here in the States. And it brought up quite a few different issues when it came to monitoring and essentially spying on Americans. And so they, they eventually got away from it, but that in itself is uh, amazing history. Uh, but this particular memo here, you could see was was classified confidential, low low grade classification, but classified nonetheless. About UFO research and the subject line. Let me read this for you. Reference B material classified confidential at his request. Source seeks guidance from CIA experts as to material in his report that should remain classified. So again, we're talking about this material of some kind. 
Uh, is it the same as uh, this particular one that I just went over? It's possible. It's the same time frame, but uh, it could potentially be a second one. We don't know because you can see here they black out case numbers as well. So when it comes to research, it's very hard to cross-reference and connect. So even if it is the same, you can see that whoever the source was, they wanted whatever this material was to stay classified. Generally, you don't do that if you're outside of the, of the U.S. government. So it is possible that request came from a CIA agent themselves. We don't know that for sure. Uh, but, but again, generally somebody from the outside who has no idea about CIA internal workings doesn't demand a confidential classification on something that they're talking about. Here's another document. This is one of my more visually interesting ones. If you're looking on screen, you can see it's primarily blacked out. You can see here that the pretty much every line here except one uh, was redacted. The one that's not, I'll read it to you, from 23 September, the year is blacked out. Uh, you can see here September 76, so this likely is 1976. Bunch of blacked out material here with personal request to investigate UFO sighted Morocco, whatever that means. Now, I want to talk to you uh, uh, quickly about something that is an aspect to the Freedom of Information Act that you can request a document to be re-reviewed after two years from its previous review. So you can see down here, this one was approved for release in 2010. They stamp it generally, they should anyway, then doesn't happen all the time, but generally they'll put the approved for release stamp on a document once it's reviewed, redacted, and released to the general public. You can then re re request a mandatory declassification review or what's called an MDR. This MDR, essentially what it's, what it's doing is after two years of a document's review, you can say, okay, CIA, it's been two years since you've looked at this thing. I want you to now re-review it, look underneath those redactions, and use the standards of now versus two years ago, because what was classified two years ago potentially is not classified now. So you can request that to happen. Here's a prime example of the result of something like that. This is an NSA document, uh, but it's it's kind of pertinent to this. This is a UF, from a UFO court case. And this was one of the previous releases. You can see here heavily blacked out top to bottom, very few words that were readable. I filed a mandatory declassification review and to my utter amazement, actually got quite a bit of the document released uh, that was not previously released. This is the same exact page. So you can see they... they a change from blackout to whiteout <laughs> simply because yeah, it's not as visually interesting. You can see a lot more information here. That is the result of an MDR. So they're very, very successful on occasion. You also fail miserably on occasion. So it's not always something that's going to yield more information, but after two years, it's your right to try. I brought this up because that document about Morocco, that UFO sighted in Morocco that's so heavily redacted, I requested an MDR on it a couple years ago. This is yet another example of a government agency essentially trying to cover this up. Why? They claim they lost it. It's not the first one. That's why this article here that I took a screenshot, I published it in March of 2020. You can go on to theblackvault.com. You can read it if you're watching on YouTube. It'll be linked below in the show notes. And if you're listening to the podcast, just know you can go to theblackvault.com slash show notes, and that will bounce you directly to the show notes page. Just find this episode that you're listening to, and you'll be able to download all that. I bring this up because this is a prime tactic for agencies like the CIA to get out of releasing more information. So this thing's been out for, what, 11 years now when it was declassified in 2010. It will always remain like what you see on your screen, primarily blacked out. We'll never know the truth. Why is that? If there's nothing to this topic, why is it that this topic always yields weird discoveries like, oops, we lost it. Oops, we shredded that material. Oops, we can't find it. Oops, 
you know, we don't want to deal with you anymore. So we lost your FOIA request. You know, whatever the excuse is, UFOs has always been the most problematic. This is one of those cases where you try and get something reviewed to see if you can extract just a little bit more information. What happens? Absolutely nothing because they lost the material. They lost the document. So visually, that is one of the, the, the cooler ones, because obviously you're, you're talking about much more classification there, uh, more secrecy than some of the other ones that are less redacted, and then voila, it's completely lost. Here's another document. Uh, this one talks about a Dr. Leon Davidson. For those who go through the, doctor, uh, the documents, you'll see that doctor's name quite a bit. Uh, Leon Davidson, I'll talk about in a minute. But this particular uh, document started a essentially a string of records that I was able to kind of piece together. And some of you who've already gone through these, you probably saw this as well, because uh, this one does stick out. Let me read it to you. Dr. Leon Davidson is on our backs again. He wants a verbatim translation of the space message and the identification of the transmitter from which it came. Skipping ahead a little bit. Elwood tells Davidson the message was an identifiable Morse code and from a known U.S. licensed radio station. This was intended to satisfy Davidson that he did not, in fact, have a space message. When you start looking at the documents, you piece together something. Dr. Leon Davidson believed that he had caught maybe like a SETI type, what we would consider like a SETI type message. We don't know a whole lot of details. We only kind of have these few documents about it, but he got something. He went, went to the CIA and said, hey, I've got this message. I need you guys to analyze it. According to the CIA, they said, hey, this is Morse code. Davidson didn't take that, and he kept pushing for answers. The documents reveal that he just kept pushing. He kept pushing. Here's uh, another document talking about the... Um, Essentially, the, 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 what I believe anyway is the taped space message that was referred to that it actually went to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Uh, this was in the 1950s, so that makes sense. Wright-Patterson Air Force Base was the home to Project Blue Book. So this is probably an example of the CIA giving over this space message to, <laughs> to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. I'm only laughing because it's just the way that it, it's written in here. Uh, but it went over to Wright Field and uh, into the Project Blue Book staff and so that they probably looked at it. Now, let me interject here with just a quick explanation on who the heck uh, Leon Davidson is. It's this gentleman right here, if you're watching the video. He was an engineering design supervisor on atomic weapons. He worked for the United States government. He was also very interested in UFOs. Uh, he is believed to have kind of spearheaded and convinced the United States Air Force to release special report number 14 from Project Blue Book. Uh, what this particular document was, was at the time in 1955 when it was published, it analyzed all UFO cases, had statistics and so on up until that point of 1955. So he obviously had a huge interest, <clears throat> but he also had a huge influence obviously, because if he's credited for getting them to release that. My point in, in kind of interjecting some background to him here is to show he wasn't a nobody. You know, this wasn't some crackpot from the middle of Kansas living on a farm saying, I, I want to see my UFO stuff. Uh, it wasn't. He was uh, obviously an individual who was highly intelligent. He was working on atomic weapons for the United States government. He believed that he found something, may have been Morse code, I'm not sure, I'm just kind of surprised someone like him wouldn't understand if he was listening to Morse code, but that's a totally different uh, debate. So I don't know what that space message is, but those documents are fairly interesting because it gives some background to this gentleman who was pushing and pushing and pushing for the CIA to address these UFO documents and UFO issues, and in this case, a space message. I went after FBI files on Dr. Leon Davidson, I actually found some. Uh, I'll also put that in the show notes page, like I referenced uh, on how to get uh, to that a couple moments ago. But I got Davidson's FBI file. You can see here from 1981, keep in mind that space message was around the 1950s. Even in 1981, I'll read this to you. 
Mr. Leon Davidson, obviously he was a doctor, but the document Mr. Leon Davidson advised that on March 29th, 1981, the New York Times business section, page F-19, predicated the assassination attempt on President Reagan. According to the New York office records, Mr. Davidson is described as a chronic letter writer and complainer. You see down here, uh, this was actually tied into the U.S. Secret Service. They shared this with the FBI. This was 1981. So obviously, whoever, um, I'm, excuse me, so obviously, whatever the intent of Dr. Davidson was, uh, he was ruffling some feathers, and that was pretty pretty uh, much indicated in the documents that came from the FBI. So a little bit of background there on a name that you see uh, quite quite often. So back to that space message. This, I also believe, was entwined in that. Uh, here is a internal message, uh, unknown person, but it says, I am afraid the longer we procrastinate, the more fuel we add to the fire. Right field are holding their, uh, excuse me, also the people at right field are holding their breaths, awaiting advice. Appreciate reply soonest. We don't know who wrote that, but that is one of the documents in what I believe was the string of space message documents. Obviously, they were sloughing Davidson off, and obviously some people just wanted this to go away. Here's another document. We have contacted Dr. Davidson by telephone advising him that we cannot resolve his problem concerning the space message and its transmitter because records on the matter have been destroyed. So their final hurrah and to try and close this was tell Davidson it's all gone. Just tell him it's destroyed. Boy, does that tactic sound familiar. I've on this channel gone through some of the same exact stories where they've told me hey, these documents are destroyed. Sorry, we just don't have them. So it's interesting that even in 1958 that they were still trying that, ah, just tell them everything was destroyed. We can't give them any answers. You see here, here's still a bunch of redacted information. So if this was just Davidson being a chronic letter writer and a, a, a feather ruffler uh, and, and, and there was nothing to the space message, I want to know what's redacted here. I want to know what they still classify about this entire story. So even though some of this stuff may be explainable, if you read between the lines, and in this case, a big fat black line, you realize there's a lot that they just don't want you to know. Even after decades, this was 1958, you're talking about a long time ago, and yet they still don't want you to know about some of this information that is likely related to whatever this space message was. So let's let the space message go. There's a lot of other stuff that you'll find in the CIA material. A lot of uh, information reports. These are intelligence that's gathered from different sources around the world. Sources are generally uh, and, and more, more likely than not to be redacted from any document, not just UFO material. But this particular one, this is going back in time a little bit to 57. This was from Iran. You can see here that they go into quite a few different details about flying objects, flying saucers, uh, flying saucers, quite a few different, um, uh, you know, different details start to emerge. I'm not going to dissect each and every one of these documents. I just wanted to kind of show you the broad strokes a little bit for those watching. Just a friendly reminder. Again, these numbers are how to get them. So you can just go and download it and read, read for yourself. Here's another one here, uh, this one from the USSR, if you can't really, really read that. I know some of these are hard to read, also part of the tactic a little bit. They are old, so that's how they're going to be, but this is also how they give them to you. You get 30th generation photocopies, which are pretty hard to read. Uh, this one, uh, you can see 1977. So this is post-Project Blue Book. So they're, they're looking at this material years after they claim they have absolutely no interest. They're collecting highly classified information, which deals with UFOs, and they're not supposed to, right? They don't have that interest. That was always the focal point of my research up until the last couple of years to show that that is one big fat lie or was a very big fat lie for decades that they claimed no interest in a phenomena they clearly were interested in. I want to zoom in on part of that document. 
and I want to read this to you. On one evening in late summer 1973, Source observed an unidentified phenomena at Site 7. While watching a sport competition between Canada and the USSR on television, he stepped outside for some air and observed an unidentified sharp, bright, green circular object or mass in the sky. The object was situated west of the site at an angle of sighting at approximately 70 degrees. The altitude of the object was undeterminable. Now, here's a, another paragraph field comment. Although there were no clouds in the sky that evening, Source believed that the green mass would have been higher than the cloud level. Source could not estimate the diameter of the object. Within 10 to 15 seconds of observation, the green circle widened, and within a brief period of time, several green concentric circles formed around the mass. Within minutes, the coloring disappeared. There was no sound, such as an explosion, associated with the phenomena. Another field comment, source had no opinion as to what this phenomena was. There was no result in rumors. Source could not provide any further details. Now, this could absolutely very well be just a meteor. You know, a green fireball enters the atmosphere, burns up, <clears throat> gets a little bit brighter as it, as it burns up. Th th that might be solvable. What's interesting, though, 10 to 15 seconds, generally you don't see those for 10 to 15 seconds. But regardless, this was intelligence from a source. The CIA collected it, has archived it, obviously was interested in it. I want to go back to this part, Site 7. I can't 100% confirm this just simply because of the lack of details in reports like this, that there's a lack of, of really kind of being detailed so you can track the source. But I believe that Site 7 was... Uh, referring to this, Vajrojdenaya Island. I probably don't have that pronounced correctly, and I'm not going to try it again, uh, but it's also known as Aralsk 7 uh, in the former Soviet Union. This was a biological weapons testing site, obviously a highly secure location. This is an aspect to UFO sightings that we've seen quite a bit over the decades in government records. Not only the CIA material, but everything. And you see how these bases, whether they be in the former Soviet Union, present day China, or here in America, or when ships are at sea, whatever this phenomena is, it's able to encroach in those sensitive areas, essentially without an issue. And that's why I wanted to kind of point out, I believe that this was considered site seven to the CIA. Everything kind of matches up with that, the USSR um, tag on it, uh, the, the time frame matched up. This facility is no longer there present day, but it was at the time. So this is potentially a likely explanation for it and reinforces that whatever this phenomena is, there's absolutely a problem with it. And there could be a big national security threat. So many people hate the threat word. I, I don't understand that. There, the potential threat behind the UAPs is palpable. When you look at documents, when you look at cases within the U.S. government, you can see going back decades how much of a threat there could be. Here's another one. This was from 1952, Blue Book era. I know I'm kind of jumping around here uh, chronologically, but uh, this particular information report uh, came from a, a, a newspaper. You'll see with CIA documents, they get their intelligence a lot from uh, newspapers and they collect that type of intelligence. They they utilize that. It's free. It's public. They're able to grab it and then bring it in internally. And and I'll talk about a system, a couple systems actually that they use to do just that uh, in a moment. But you'll you'll notice that in CIA records, especially this UFO stuff. But this was 1952 from the Belgian Congo. You'll see here the entire document itself. This sketch here, which is actually pretty cool. This is uh, what the object or the flying saucer allegedly looked like. Let me zoom in and read it for you. Just a few uh, sections. Recently, two fiery disks were sighted over the uranium mines located in the southern part of the Belgian Congo. The, quote, saucer had a diameter of 12 to 15 meters. Now, that's about 15 feet or so in diameter. The inner core remained absolutely still, and a knob coming out from the center and several small openings could plainly be seen. 
The outer rim was completely veiled in fire and must have had an enormous speed of rotation. The color of the metal was similar to that of aluminum. Changes in elevation from 800 to 1,000 meters, or that's 26 to 3,300 feet, could be accomplished in a few seconds. So let me stop there and reiterate that. That's about a 700 uh, foot change in elevation approximately in seconds that this object was uh, allowed to do. He estimated their speed at about 1,500 kilometers per hour. So these flying saucers were going about 1,500 kilometers per hour or approximately 932 miles an hour. Now this becomes important when you think about the time frame in 1952. Here's a breakdown of all of the airspeed records that have been documented over that time frame. This particular one in 1952 that was made in an F-86 Sabre jet, they only accomplished about 700, not even 700 miles per hour. So if the estimates were true, even if they were off a little bit, you're still talking about faster at, at this time frame, faster than any aircraft was flying. So was he wrong on this? Well, possibly. We can chalk it up to that if you'd like. But if this is even remotely close to being accurate, you couple that with going roughly 700 feet up or down uh, in, in elevation in seconds. And here's another part that I didn't read to you. The disks often shot down to within 20 meters of the treetops. So obviously these things were flying all over the place at incredible speeds. And yet we weren't supposed to be really interested in this kind of stuff because they solved it years later. In the pursuit of science, the one point I would make at this is you could look at, let's say, well, here's a buzzword, a vaccine. If you look at a thousand vaccine possibilities, but only 10 show promise, do you give up because it's only 10? If you're looking for a cure for cancer and you look at a thousand and 10 methods to do it and a thousand of them fail, but 10 show promise, do you give up? Science only needs one of these things to be true or one of those vaccines to work or one of those cures to work. If you're truly looking at this from a scientific viewpoint, it doesn't matter if the Air Force overall looked at over 12,006 or 700 sightings. They said that 701 remained unidentified, but then they, they felt maybe that they could identify them. Well, let's really kind of evaluate that. They couldn't identify them. Therefore, why would you give up? Why would you give up on that small percentage, albeit very small percentage, but a percentage nonetheless that you just can't explain? If any of this is remotely even close to being true, this was technology that we just did not have at the time that it was seen. Multiple craft doing maneuvers that we couldn't do, traveling at speeds that we couldn't do. It only takes one. So we're supposed to believe that all these intelligence agencies just said, "Yeah, who cares? You know, we don't, we don't, we don't care about any of that. I, I just don't, I don't buy it. Around this time frame, uh, going with the same era as the Belgian Congo, which was 55. So again, Blue Book was still going, but obviously they ignored those cases by the end. 1952, this was a very interesting time frame for the CIA because they started realizing they needed to do something about the public perception of flying saucers and UFOs and so on. And in these released documents, you start to paint even more of the picture of what the CIA was trying to essentially accomplish. And intertwined in that explanation, which is obviously one that they wanted to debunk the topic, is a very interesting statement. Let me read this to you. 1952, this was in August. This was a uh, document about flying saucers. I'm going to read this quote here, less than 100 at the, and this was the, at the time in 1952, less than 100 reasonably credible reports remain unexplainable at this time. Regarding these reports, there is no pattern of specific sizes, configurations, characteristics, performance, or location. The sources of these reports are generally no more or less credible 
uh, than the sources of the other categories. It is probable that if complete information were available for presently unexplainable reports, they too could be evaluated into categories as indicated in quote A above. So essentially what they're trying to say is we have a, a stack of cases that we can't identify, but if we had more information, we probably could. Well, no kidding. Like how, how dumb is that to kind of say? I mean, of course, if you had more information, you could identify them. But the point is, is you don't have the proper information to identify them. There's still a question mark. And as we just explained with the, the past um, report from the Belgian Congo, there's evidence there that's verifiable evidence, or at least from the source anyway, that gives you the information that this is a true unknown, that we didn't have technology at that time to do everything that the source said that it did. So this was showing a pattern that even though there was some promising cases, they wanted to explain it away. I want to jump down to this line, which actually I remember reading this years ago and forgot that they had said that. Uh, let me read it. Interplanetary aspects and alien origin not being thoroughly excluded from consideration. What they're saying here is that they didn't rule out aliens. So they're not dismissing that, which is really fascinating to me. I mean, they were doing this for five years. I mean, if there was nothing to it, wouldn't you by five years into something go, look, this is probably all easily explainable weather balloons and so on and so forth. Uh, but we can't rule out aliens. I always felt that that was a, a, an interesting line and then ended up forgetting about it through the years and doing this presentation, stumbled upon it again, and i um, glad I did. Here's another line. It is recommended that CIA surveillance of subject matter in coordination with proper authorities of primary operational concern at ATIC or, uh, or essentially Wright-Patterson Air Force Base be continued. It is strongly urged, however, that no indication of CIA interest or concern reach the press or public in view of their probable alarmist tendencies to accept, accept um, such interest as confirmatory of the soundness of unpublished facts in the hands of the U.S. government. Essentially, the CIA wanted absolutely no connection to the UFO topic at all. So they wanted to be re removed from it altogether. So that is, is what they were essentially doing with this particular document. Now, around the same time frame that this document was written, the CIA decided to convene what they called the Robertson Panel. This was 1952, late 1952. They decided to bring all the scientists together that were essentially working on the flying saucer problem. Their aim was to evaluate all the evidence up until that point and figure out what to do. Should they continue the investigation? What would their objectives be and so on and so forth. They published a report called the Robertson Panel Report. This as well is a video in itself. It's a very interesting era of, of ufology, just simply because this really then, in my opinion, steered Project Blue Book altogether, if there was any scientific merit to what they were doing, steered it to just being a PR campaign, steering it to just saying, hey, we're researching UFOs, but there's nothing to them. They were trying to calm the nerves of the U.S. Uh, public and get them to just not be interested in it. And in this Robertson panel report, I'll link that also below in the show notes so you guys can read it uh, and, ha and have fun with it because there's, you know, there's a lot to it. But essentially, the most important part to me was the, one of the conclusions. And the conclusion was that they didn't feel that the UFO phenomena was a threat to national security. They felt the general public was a threat to national security, that they alone could overload the systems and, and get alarmed about some kind of UFO sighting that they heard about or mass hysteria and essentially overload the systems trying to call 911, get answers for the problem. They needed to calm that down. That is what the Robertson panel had concluded. That was a bigger threat to them than whatever these flying saucers were. That's arguable in my book, meaning that, the, in my opinion, there was ample evidence to show that there was a threat. But regardless, they wanted to calm the public. That was one of their, that was one of their aims and goals. So the Robertson panel was, was another very interesting aspect to the CIA material that came out. And then again, with some of those memos, you can really see internally what their true objectives were. 
I mentioned to you guys about newspaper articles being collected as intelligence. And this makes sense because, well, there's a lot of research that does go into media articles around the globe. And although it's not always 100% accurate, like we already talked about, at least it's free to agencies like this. And so they developed a couple systems over the years, really kind of fascinating history in itself. You can, you can tell like, as you, as you watch me uh, reference points like this, and I, and I call them videos in themselves, it's because there's so much history that goes into some of this stuff. Uh, these systems were called the Joint Publications Research Service and the Foreign Broadcast Information Service. You'll see them referred to in the documents if you're watching on screen here. Uh, you'll see the JPRS. So you'll see that in some of the uh, documents here. Uh, again, JPRS. Uh, and then also the FBIS, Foreign Broadcast Information Service. And you'll see those references as well. So JPRS, uh, FBIS. And you'll see the the acronyms here. I, I apologize. They're flipped here on this particular slide. But regardless, you see the FBIS and, and JPRS there. So that's what these systems were. They were utilized by the intelligence community to just say, okay, let's 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 find out what's been reported about uh, whatever, rockets, satellites, UFOs. They can punch it into a search engine and it spits out everything from, let's say, Soviet uh, Soviet newspapers at the time or Chinese periodicals. They, they were looking especially at Russia and China at the time for obvious reasons to see what they were doing, what they were being told by their news media, what kind of issues were they covering. And you'll see a lot of that in the CIA documents. It might be, it might be the cause of some confusion as well. And that's why I want to kind of explain this a little bit on these two particular systems, because remember back in the beginning of this, of this, I talked about that second box that I got from the CIA, and a lot of it was newspaper articles. This is what I'm referring to, that it was all the FBIS material. Uh, it wasn't 100%, but it was a lot of FBIS material that had been collected on UFOs. The question is why? How did they utilize that material? Why did they want it? Did they collect 100% of all articles ever printed by every media outlet ever? I don't think so. So obviously there was a reason why they were keep kind of keeping tabs on this particular topic and, and this particular issue. And that was what was very evident with that second release. <coughs> Excuse me. And so the material there, which I've kind of seen through social media, Reddit, uh, Twitter and so on. I want to make sure and point this out to you guys that that make sure when you're reading a document, it, it you're not taking it as that was written by the CIA, meaning did a UFO blow up a rocket or did aliens land on the moon or whatever article you might come up with. And yes, there are some very outlandish headlines in there. Uh, I'm going to bring up this one here. Uh, but just, just to kind of give you an idea of, of what these documents look like, you'll see where it, it's um, essentially translated from a newspaper. You can see here reprint from the newspaper. I'm not even going to try and pronounce that. Uh, but this was from the Ukraine in 1993. And I'll, I'll read something that's actually quite humorous on this particular one. But this is an example of, of again, that translated foreign press that the CIA was using as intelligence. Here's an excerpt from that. As reported by the authoritative magazine Canadian Weekly World News, U.S. intelligence obtained a 250-page file on the attack by a UFO on a military unit in Siberia. The file contains not only many documentary photographs and drawings, but also testimonies by actual participants in the events. One of the CIA representatives referred to this case as a, quote, a horrific picture of revenge on the part of extraterrestrial creatures, a picture that makes one's blood freeze, unquote. Obviously, this is from the Weekly World News. If you don't know what that was, it was a tabloid National Enquirer type uh, periodical. And so here this is being cited by this Ukrainian paper as authoritative go figure. But but that's what I wanted to point out to you guys is make sure that you look at what type of document that you're looking at and make sure you understand what you're looking at because this could 
uh, very much be misconstrued as, oh my gosh, here is a CIA admission about revenge by extraterrestrial creatures and something being shot down and so on and so forth. And that's not what it is. It's it's simply a translation. This, I believe, is part of that uh, tactic by the CIA also to essentially frustrate researchers a little bit. I'm going to look at it in two different angles. The positive way to look at it is the CIA was watching UFO reporting around the world. So you can't get beyond that. And that's that's in the, this was 1990, um, 1993. So obviously they were still collecting these types of UFO records, even though these this particular one's a little bit silly and they're referencing the weekly world news. Regardless, it shows that they were watching UFO reporting on a worldwide scale. That's the optimistic way to look at it. The pessimistic way that I also throw out there to you guys is the fact that that you then get buried by hundreds of these of these pages, hundreds and hundreds of them of these pages. And and I can't tell you how many times I, I saw people say, I loaded like three, four or five of these. They're all newspaper articles. What a waste of time. And and I don't blame them for for posting that at all. Uh, but it's not accurate. It's not 100%. But arguably on the newer stuff, it's the majority. And I think that that's part of, of the tactic by the CIA to, to essentially make you lose interest. Like who wants to go through 3,000 pages? You know, I mean, I geek out over it, but I'm also a rarity and I'm a geek. So that that being said, there's not a whole lot of people that want to sit down and go through 3,000 pages, which is partly why I was doing this video to give you just a very brief overview in history but also encourage you, don't get discouraged. Look at why they were collecting these these UFO newspaper articles, um, but don't get discouraged because in my opinion, that's exactly what they want. I see this a lot too with other topics when I research through FOIA, different government secrets. A lot of times you get too much information, as surprising as that might sound. You get too much, you get a lot of irrelevant material. And I think the reason is, is because it makes your it makes your job and process that much harder to go through the material, find out what's there, and uh, essentially come up with some type of viable conclusion. And that's part of that tactic. Bury them in documents. The CIA thinks to themselves, bury the general public with hundreds of thousands of pages on the JFK assassination. So we can just say, hey, we've been transparent, but at the end of the day, it's going to take years for people to go through that material that's not sorted and make some type of conclusion, a viable theory, whatever it might be. That is true with the JFK assassination stuff. That is true with UFO material. So my biggest advice is don't give up. Going back to this weekly world news, though, I just want to point out something that I had discovered, which... For what it's worth, I mean, the Weekly World News, again, was just a tabloid paper. But this isn't the first time, nor the first agency that has found UFO material connected to these tabloids in, in all of, of a mystery, essentially. This is Dr. Jar uh, Charles Stahl, and uh, he was part of the Defense Health Agency. He was a doctor, well-known, passed away quite a few years ago. And I had found a reference to a UFO article in his personal papers, ended up going through FOIA to get it, actually did get it. And this popped up, which was a weekly world news tabloid article that was in his personal collection. Why? We'll never know. The gentleman passed away, as I mentioned. Uh, why did he have this in his particular files? Um, there's really kind of no explanation. But for whatever reason, these tabloids have turned up now on numerous occasions through the CIA and the Defense Health Agency with these government officials. The question is why? It's not all tabloid stuff, so don't get me wrong. I just wanted to bring it up and go, that's not the first time I've been surprised to find these tabloids turn up. So what does this essentially all mean? Like what, like what, some people want to know, so the CIA admitted to aliens? And they want that smoking gun. And I'm here to tell you that no matter what the issue is, no matter what it is, UFOs or anything, to get a definitive conclusion or answer from the United States government is like pulling teeth 
and nearly impossible. If you're a journalist, an investigator, or curious mind alike, you need to look at the evidence and come up with your own conclusion. There's a lot of people that know that a lot of, uh, that a lot of those documents are newspaper articles, but they find value in that. That, that it's like going through somebody's scrapbook that collected UFO newspaper clippings for decades, which are incredibly valuable. And for me, as the person that kind of put it all out there and, and, and gave this easy access, it's one of the best feelings that I get to see how people react to the information, to understand how other people define it, to evaluate it and to base their own conclusions off of it. And it's a wide range of conclusions and theories and so on and so forth that I have seen posted just on this material. And I love seeing that. In the last week, the traffic has been incredible. People are starting to see that there's a lot more material than the US government military wants us to believe is there. I'm here to, to conclude this video, just focusing on the CIA documents and only a couple of them, by the way, and, and that's by design because I don't want to lead you to believe what I do. I don't want to lead you and say, these are the most interesting because I'll be honest, I've seen a lot of posts where people have pulled stuff out and go, wow, this is the most fascinating document to me. And I go, wow, that didn't even stick out to me, but that really is interesting. That is something important. How did I miss that? So again, I never want to lead people to say, hey, you guys need to believe what I do. So only look at document one, 500 and 1202 uh, and nothing else. That's not what this is. I want to encourage you to look at all of it and see what it means to you. But I also want to stress this CIA UFO material is simply the tip of the iceberg. And I'm talking about a very small tip to a much bigger iceberg that I've been um, doing this for 25 years and have come up with thousands upon thousands of, of pages of documents that connect to UFOs and then stretch beyond it. And there is a amazing history there. There is an amazing story to be told. And these CIA UFO documents are not it. You're not going to find that smoking gun that a lot of people want. A lot of people have asked me through the last few days, what is the most you know valuable document? You're not going to find the smoking gun to prove this is all aliens. You're just not. I don't want to be a skeptic or debunker or negative person by saying that, but you're just not. But again, you're not going to find a definitive answer with anything you ask the government about or research. You just have to look at the evidence. And that is what I would recommend to all of you. National Security Agency, Defense Intelligence Agency, the FBI, I have collections for all of those agencies and all of those agencies I just named and more all have UFO documents, some of which I would argue is actually more interesting than the CIA stuff, but that's a different video in itself. With that, I hope you enjoyed this. Please tell me what makes, tell me what makes you interested in this when you look at the documents. Away from what I showed you, if you found other documents, post them in the comments below here on YouTube, make comments uh, elsewhere on social media, point people to the archive because people need access to this to make up their own conclusions. And what else I would love for you guys to do, especially if you're on YouTube, please hit that like button down there, the thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel and turn the notifications on. If you're listening to the podcast, please, if you could, offer a review. I always aim for five stars. I'm not going to tell you what to put, but that is my aim and goal. I hope I achieved it for you, and it will be a huge help if you could give that rating, and kudos to you guys who do both of those. Go to the YouTube channel, hit that thumbs up, subscribe, but also add that five-star review if you can on the podcast iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you listen, the Black Vault Radio is there. I can't wait till next time. There's still a lot more to cover and a lot of surprises coming your way. So thanks for tuning in. This is John Greenwald Jr. signing off. We'll see you next time.